Hey, Carrier Candice, um, I can't use my video. It says the host has stopped it. Good morning. Good morning. Anybody there yet? Good morning. Hi. <clears throat> I think we're still getting set up with video. Okay. Candace, I still can't turn my video on. I don't see the option for language.
Hi, Gabriella. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Candice with Central Staff. We're just getting you all connected right now, so it'll just be a moment. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, uh, can you make me a co I'm on here twice. I just have two um, devices so far. And I was wondering if you can make them both co-hosts. Or panelists. Perfect, thank you. Let's see Sheila, is there anyone else coming from the administration? Will, BPDA, lots. Um, I think Tim Davis is gonna be on. There's a whole bunch of us. Okay. Just give it a couple here. minutes, it's 10 I'm here, I just have my video off. Tim is there, Sheila. There's a lot of folks who need to be let in from the attendee list. Yeah, Will's in. Will want? Will you're in? <laughs> this is great. There's a lot of. I would say everyone could get in right now.
Hey, Councilor Edwards, it's Candace. Yeah. I'm actually trying to call you on your cell phone. Uh, yeah, I'm using my cell, so let me do this. Um, all right, go ahead. Can you want to call me? It's ringing now. We're just waiting on a quick technical issue. Make sure that we have all that up and running. And I see Sanal is here. Jonathan is here. Will. Aloha. Tim, Sheila Davis, and So I have Will, Tim, Sheila, Sanal, and Jonathan. Are there other folks in the admin coming? Kate Bennett. Brian Glasscock is here from BPDA. Brian Glasscock. I'm here. Okay. Okay. And I see Councillor Bach and Braden. I can't imagine why people aren't so excited. I'm here too, Madam Chair. Uh, Councilor Wu? Yeah. I think I saw Councilor Flynn as well. Councilor Flynn? The Flynn? Good morning, morning Councilor Edwards. Excellent.
Great to see how many folks are from the community are here. And I'll give an orientation about what work consultants do. So it's 10 10. Um, and I have a second working session uh, this afternoon on banning facial recognition, which is also going to be uh, pretty intense. <laughs> so I, I'm going to go ahead and get started if that's um, okay with folks. Wait, oh, I'm sorry. Candace, are we okay with interpretation? I want to make sure that we're, we're good. Yeah, I think we're, I think we're all set. We got it up and running. I think uh, Gabriella just has to select the language and we should be all set to go. Sorry for the delay. Should I? Oh, no, I think that's, uh, we should demonstrate equity while we're trying to push for it, right? So I don't, I don't regret that. Um, Excuse me, I don't see the option to select the language. Should I leave the meeting and come back? If you don't mind, that, that should do it. Okay. okay. Yeah, we'll just take the time for that then. I've heard from Councillor Janey and I've heard from Councillor Arroyo that they're on their way or coming on. And Kim, I'm not sure if you can hear, I mean, sorry, um, Kim, is Kim here? Kim's coming. Um, do you guys know, are we recording already? Are we live? We are live and recording, but we haven't started formally. Okay, so I'm gonna log back off and then come back on. Yeah. I'm trying to find Kim. Can you hear me, Madam Chair, just a mic check. Councilor Flaherty, we do hear you. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Happy Juneteenth. Yeah. Good morning, Councilor Edwards. This is Liz Braden. Councilor Braden, I have you as number two to show up today. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. I have Councilor Bach, Councilor Braden, Councilor Wu, Councilor Flynn, Councilor uh, Flaherty. And I know Councillor Arroyo and Councillor Janey said that they will be coming. Get myself set up here. I still don't see the language option. I tried again and, and you know I don't I don't know what why it's not working. Um, maybe it just takes a little bit of time to, to enable. So I said we get started and, and I'll continue to tinker and hopefully we can get it up and running um, as soon as possible. Okay. All right, then we'll we'll get started. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Lydia Edwards. This is the Committee on Government Operations. Today is June nineteenth. And this working session is on docket 0232, an order regarding a text amendment for the zoning, uh, Boston zoning code relative to affirmatively furthering for housing. I'm the sponsor of this matter, and it was uh, referred to this committee on January 29th, 2020. The committee held two previous working sessions on February 27th and April 22nd of this year. Um, by the way, happy Juneteenth to echo Councillor Flaherty. Um, and today is our third working session. Um, this is, uh, I wanna get through some, some of my colleagues cannot be here today, but before I get to that, I'll just note, we're meeting on Zoom per the Governor, Baker, Governor Baker's executive order, modifying open meeting laws. Uh, the public may watch this meeting via live stream at www 
www.boston.gov slash city dash council dash TV. It will also be rebroadcasted at a later date on Comcast 8 slash RCN82 slash Verizon 1964. For public testimony, um, written comments may be sent to the committee on, excuse me, on government ops. And that, that email is at ccc.go at boston.gov. And will be made part of the record. This is a working session, so it's not necessarily open to public comment. Um, and I wanted to just remind folks that doesn't mean that you wouldn't, we can't call on you or that you can't have an opinion. It just means that you're, the point of this is to actually have us work in front of you for the open meeting laws about uh, this particular amendment. Um, and happy to, uh, for those of you who have technical or thoughts specifically about what we're talking at the time, if you raise your hand, that will be more helpful to me. Um, general um, expressions of support or not support is not, um, this is not tech, the, the, the specific form for that. Um, I do appreciate the immense amount of people who are here today. And I know a lot of folks have um, gotten the documents and looked and seen the amendment. And if you have specific questions about the amendment um, and concerns, that's what we're really looking to address as well. Um, before I get started, I have one more statement to read from my colleague. One second, everyone wants to text now. Uh, apologies. This is from my colleague, uh, Nisa Asabi George, who cannot be here with us today. Um, to the Committee on Government Operations, please be advised that I will be absent from today's working session on docket 0232 regarding uh, amending the zoning, Boston Zoning Code relative to affirmatively furthering for housing. I'm traveling with my family and will not have enough service to reliably tune in virtually. I will review the recording of the working session. Despite my absence, I would like to offer my continued support for the proposed language. I am grateful to Councilor Edwards and for the advocates who are asking the city of Boston to do more than affirm a culture. I hope the significance of holding this hearing on Juneteenth is understood. Fair housing is not possible without reckoning with the way generations of racist ideologies and policies shape the formation of our society, our current housing market, and the huge racial wealth gap we see in Boston. We as a city can do more and should do more. I believe that this language is a reasonable and needed amendment to our zoning code. Thank you. Anissa Sabi George, Councilor at Large. Okay. And I believe we've also, also been joined by Councillor Arroyo. Councillor Janey, have you joined us as well? Maybe not yet, okay. So um, we'll get right to it. I think one thing I <clears throat> wanted to do, I, um, I will note, we are joined today by the administration from uh, Chief uh, Sheila Dillon from Housing. I wanna say Commissioner Will, Chief Will. <laughs> I keep promoting people all the time. <laughs> I'm the executive director, but I mean, who's asking? <laughs> sure, sure. Will o Onuoha from Fair Good Housing. Job. Brian uh, Glass. I don't know. Are, are, do we have chiefs and, and commissioners in the VPDA or directors? All right. So we're joined by uh, the, several members of the VPDA, um, including Brian Glasscock, Sonal Gandhi, Jonathan Greeley, and um, I believe, <clears throat> sorry, Tim, I'm Tim Davis. I, sorry, I, I missed you okay. from housing. And then also we're joined by um, Kate Bennett from the BHA, Boston Housing Authority. Did I get everyone from the administration? Very well. Thanks. So I'm um, very excited um, to announce uh, that to my joy, utter joy and glee, uh, the administration has uh, sent over um, several documents uh, that that allude to the, I think a commitment to have zoning, uh, a zoning code amendment to affirmatively further fair housing. Um, specifically, um, 
the B I want to read from one of the documents. The BPDA's mission is to plan and guide inclusive growth in Boston, creating opportunities for everyone to live, work, and connect. <clears throat> At this moment in our city's history, in partnership with the mayor and the rest of the administration, the BPDA reaffirms its commitment to equitable planning and development as it guides necessary growth. By including resilient growth in partnership with communities throughout the neighborhoods of Boston and leveraging funding through large scale real estate development for affordable housing, workforce training and development. The BPDA strives to create a more equitable city for all. And I want to ask the members of the BPDA and the administration, if, if I read this language, I understand that there is a commitment then to have and to amend the Boston Zoning Code to affirmatively further fair housing. Am I correct in that commitment? You are yeah. yes. completely correct. And we are excited to be here to discuss this with you, Councilor Edwards. That means a lot. That means a lot. Um, so with that commitment, I'm also asking for a commitment for a timeline um, that gets this done. And I'm hoping by September or the fall. By that, by done, I mean um, we vetted, we go back and forth, and hopefully we have a compromised zoning amendment that we can all live with and that you support this in front of the zoning commission and that it becomes part of our zoning code. Again, excited to tell you that we're committed to that timeline as well. Very well then, Councillor Bach. I'm excited to tell you we're not voting on it in July 8th, okay? <laughs> um, and so what I will say is uh, because there's a lot in front of us and that's a good thing, the good, that's a good thing. Um, there are several different ways in which we have approached this, and that's also a normal thing to everybody watching, okay? We approach things differently, but I heard for the first time a full-on commitment to get there together. And that means an immense amount, so I want to thank you. Um, that being said, um, the amendments, I would say the proposed language and the, uh, the administration's proposed language really differ in three major buckets. Um, there are, first, the major bucket is with regards to definitions, whereas the proposed language has several definitions. The BPDA's um, zoning proposal does not have as many or I think any definitions. The second major bucket would be with regards to um, the, uh, which I think is great, actually I don't even oppose, I think it's wonderful. Uh, the proposed language sticks at large project review the BPDA has actually expanded that review to include small project review under Article 80. Um, the proposed language, another bucket, the proposed language really goes down into adding affirmatively furthering for housing standards in PDA, right, planning development area assessment and two ways, one in general, putting it into the PDA and then two also making sure mitigation is also viewed with an eye towards equity. That's a difference from the administrations. And then I want to say the other major bucket, which we may not get to today because those are large buckets, is implementation documents. So those are, I think, have I characterized the differences pretty well? I don't know who's speaking, you know, who, who's going to. No, I think that this is Sheila. I think that's a good outline. Very well. Yeah, no, I, that, that's right. Right. Okay. So yeah. that's where we're, we're different. I do understand. Um, and I think that we're, we're clear that this is a baseline conversation. Both are drafts and both are going to be modified. Uh, I will shortly turn it over to the administration. If you wanted to break down your draft a little further than what I did, I just wanted to make sure that I was clear on where we differed to the folks to everyone. And then Councillor Bach also had several suggestions as well. To make sure again that we have a guided conversation, I think we'll very likely just get to two major buckets today, which I think is the definitions bucket. Very likely, probably that might take a good chunk of the day. And then dealing with the second bucket that I discussed, um, the two inclusion things that the BPDA put in that I think are great. You mentioned utilities and small project review. And I'll see how far that gets us. Is that a fair movement on our part? 
and then I will very likely will have to schedule another working session, but I'm very excited. And again, confirming we have a full on commitment that, and I'll say this too, um, the city of Boston will lead the nation. We will have the first zoning amendment for fair housing in the United States when we're done. So happy Juneteenth, absolutely. Um, so to the administration, whoever would like to go. Um, sure, I'm, I'm, Sheila, do you wanna? Well, yeah, I was, um, it sounds like we're gonna jump right in. Uh, Councillor Edwards, did you wanna start talking about the definitions or did you want opening statements or looking for organization? I, I think it would be helpful if you did opening statements and then moved right into the definition section. Okay. Actually, no opening statements, excuse me. And then I think Councillor Bach had a, did a significant amount of work. I would like for her to also summarize or talk to her thoughts. Very, very good. And I, I will be very brief and, and then hand it over to Councillor Bach and, and Sanal for, uh, to, to get into the, to the meat of this. But um, I just want to state for the administration that and the respective agencies, the Department of Neighborhood Development, Fair Housing, and the BPDA that um, we, are, we are very committed uh, to working on this with the council. We are committed to finding common ground. Um, and I, we did wanna take a moment, Councillor Edwards, and thank you for your commitment on this, um, not only to the concept, I mean, we're all very dedicated to the concept of affirmatively furthering fair housing, but your, your tireless work and the council's tireless work to operationalize this ideal. Because if we do that and we do it correctly, we will reduce displacement, segregation and exclusion. And that is something we all want. Those are hard, hard issues. They have been with us for a long time, but if we do this right, we, we, we really believe that we're going to make progress. Um, I just wanna say also, I wanna give a thanks and a shout out to the AFFH Community Advisory Committee um, and I, you know, want to say very, um, and I want to give a heartfelt thank you for your work on this. And um, once again, state D and D's commitment, working with our colleagues here, that we're going to finish um, and updating the uh, our affirmatively for furthering fair housing plan. Um, we, you will see <clears throat> an updated with new data, a new draft in weeks, not months. And I, we really want to get that that plan done as well because it's a it's a real important companion piece to this work. Um, and so just finally, um, we, are, we are entering this working session, if it's one, two or three, um, very committed. And we really wanna work with you because if we get this right, we'll benefit Bostonians that are here now and certainly generations to come. So thank you, thank you for your work on this. We really do appreciate it. We're very glad to be here. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, I'd like to I'd like to echo what, what Sheila just said. You know, many many thanks to the AFFH Advisory Committee. I know there's been many many uh, weeks, months, years of work um, collectively, hours and hours and hours of work on this, and this has been extremely helpful and informative to our work. So thank you first to the Advisory Committee for being so committed to this important issue. Um, we're also very grateful to um, all our partners at City, uh, the DND, the BPDA, the Office of Fair Housing. Um, you know, after the housing stability, um, what you see today is a collaborative effort to, you know, this is an important issue that spans the entire city. Um, and the BPDA is one of, you know, the, the zoning, the, the zoning is an important part of it, but is, is one of the goals of the AFFH. Um, it's an important one. And, and Councilor Edwards, as you mentioned, we're super excited to be talking about this as one of the first in the, as the first in the country. Um, I also want to stress that this, this, AF, this zoning amendment and this topic has commanded the attention of staff at the BPDA at all levels. Uh, Director Golden has been fully involved and is fully supportive of the proposal you see in front of you today. And so I wanted to stress that this has been, um, this has been received and proposed uh, very, uh, with a lot of enthusiasm um, at the BPDA as well. So I just want to make sure that we're, we're stressing that point as well. Um, I can quickly do a brief overview of this, of what we're proposing, if that's helpful. If not, I'm happy to jump into how, we, how are we allowed to take it, Councilor Edwards. Um, I didn't know if anyone else from the administration or Kate, if anyone wanted to say anything um, before you jump in, um, before you jumped in, Sanal. Yeah, thank you. 
Thanks, Councillor. Just um, happy to be at this point. Thank you. Okay. Very well. Um, go ahead, Sanal. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, so we've talked about the FH and the uh, advisory committee. I want to just outline what we're proposing in the zoning amendment. What we're proposing um, is a zoning amendment that does the following. It addresses the risk of both residential and commercial displacement at project sites and surrounding communities. So what we're doing is we're asking that we're looking at the displacement of residential and commercial. Uh, we've seen you know, over the years that commercial tenants um, also struggle with this displacement. And this is, I think, an important point that we'd like to make sure we're addressing in this, uh, in this version of the zoning amendment. Uh, we're addressing the historical exclusion of protected classes from neighborhoods. Um, really important point that you want to make sure that we're, we're capturing, um, you know, as we talk about this, as we move forward, as we move forward, we're promoting inclusive communities. Uh, we're promoting full and equal access to persons with disabilities. Um, this is extremely exciting for us. We have had, we've been working with the, the mayor's office with the an accessibility checklist that's been board approved um, in 2017 and updated in 2019. And it's part of our review process. It's a, you know, and we would like to make sure that we are putting that into our zoning code. It's part of the fair housing conversation. And we are extremely excited to bring this forward today as part of the package and part of the zoning amendment. Uh, we also wanna ensure that we are um, delivering equitable, resilient and innovative utility services across the city. And, um, and that is a kind of brief big picture overview of what the zoning amendment is. Um, as you mentioned, we are we have assessment tools that we have we, we proposed. The assessment tools, you know, they have there are two pieces here that we still need a little bit of work on, and that's on the analysis of displacement and the analysis of, of historical exclusion. So there are, you know, it's they're, they're in italics in the assessment tool, but we wanted to make sure you've seen them as soon as you can, as soon as we, as soon as possible. Um, and this is a work in progress, and those tools are still to be worked on but we are going to be applying these assessment tools to large projects, to PDAs, and as you said, to small projects across the city as well. Uh, a lot of the displacement occurs in small. No. In, yeah. Can you repeat the name of those two assessment tools? I have an analysis of displacement, and what was the second one? Historical exclusion. Historical exclusion. Yeah. The analysis of historical historic exclusion. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, of course, of course. Um, so, uh, so yes, and so, you know, like I said, small projects, commercial space, the person with disabilities, utility services, and then the risk of displacement and commercial uh, on the project site and the surrounding communities and addressing historical exclusion. So uh, we have assessment tools that we proposed there, you know, I'm happy to pull them up on the screen if folks would like to see them um, or, or anyone in the office can pull them up because I know they're, they're shared. Um, but that's, they're quite detailed and, um, and, 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 you know, fully ready to discuss anything you'd like to discuss at this point. Thank you. And I think what we're, like I had mentioned at the very beginning for my colleagues, so I believe we've also been joined by, if I didn't say Councillor Royo, also Councillor O'Malley was here briefly. He may still be here. Um, for my colleagues who may have just come on and for those who are, who just signed on, um, because there's so many facets to this conversation, the differences, the things to keep, so on and so forth. And then the implementation is really the where the rubber meets the road. There's the documents, the assessment tools. Uh, we all have, I think I'm gonna definitely separate those two conversations so that the assessment tool conversation doesn't be, get uh, mired in the actual language of the zoning code. We will definitely, I think, as you mentioned, all of them are in a work in progress. Right. And so we can maybe make them readily available for more discussion about how we implement. And I think a lot of advocates, um, the, 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 um, the task force, so on and so forth, would love to be part of helping to shape those tools, making sure they're community friendly, making sure, you know, all sorts of ways in which people can can use and read them. So I'm, I'm again, I'm excited, but I do think that we're we're going to have to get to the language um, piece uh, with that. I wanted to turn over to my colleagues, if any of them had introductory remarks, including Councillor Bach, who also has submitted some uh, substantive suggestions as well. So I'll turn it over, Councillor Bach. 
you're muted. Oh, there sorry. Thank, thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, really glad to be here today um, and glad to uh, have all these substantive documents uh, in front of us. I um, I sent around a memo, I think most folks have, um, and, and Councillor Edwards has incorporated it into the comparison document. Um, the, the two big things that I emphasized in that memo is the importance of, um, of building in the implementation piece here. Um, and I think, I think importantly, Councillor Edwards is making a distinction that a lot of the things that you need to really implement a fair housing lens effectively in zoning are not gonna be in the zoning. They're gonna be documents that live outside the zoning, but they need pegs in the zoning. Right? They need places in the zoning that acknowledges them and that establishes their standing so that then we can we can develop them and they can have standing in our in our processes. So that was one of the big pieces that I flagged and um, and I did some work in my memorandum around what that scaffolding might look like, um, keeping in mind uh, the kinds of processes that the BPD has and BPDA has in other areas. Um, so a bunch of work on that front, um, folks can look at, and I appreciated the fact that the BPDA also, I think has come with the start of a bunch of that kind of scaffolding as well. Um, the other thing that I uh, emphasize, and it's something that I emphasized at our last working session, um, and, and again, I, I, appreciate the, I appreciate the BPDA incorporating this into their documents, and I appreciate Councillor Edwards' openness to it as well. Um, I think when we're talking about fair housing, we're really talking about two pieces. Um, we're talking both about how we prevent displacement and keep people in protected classes from being pushed out of the city, um, which is a major dynamic right now. And we're also like we're also looking historically at the places where zoning has excluded protected classes and affirmatively, proactively trying to make those places accessible to those folks. And I think that the only way to kind of pursue that dual mission effectively is to have an awareness of that, like of the fact that it's a dual mission, right? And that you're trying to achieve both those things. Um, so one of the things that I flagged is the need to have that kind of tool and lens set up for historical exclusion alongside the setup for displacement. Um, and so that's some of that's some of what I suggested. Um, and then overarchingly, I would just say, um, I think it's really important as we continue this conversation about a zoning amendment to to know that, you know, effective effective zoning is actionable. Like it's something that people People can implement, it can be implemented as effectively as possible in, the, in development processes. One of the things I've said in a, to a few different folks in this process is like, I, I don't think we won't get great fair housing conscious development by having all our developers become fair housing experts. What we wanna do is, is as a city, think about what is, um, what's the fair housing scaffolding that's gonna guide this process so that that's always an element um, in, in, in the conversation. Um, and yeah, and I just, I, I'm looking forward to, um, to doing some of this in the weeds conversation today. And I agree with Councillor Edwards that probably it's going to be a few working sessions, um, given the, given the quantity of stuff. Um, but, uh, but I really, I really just want to emphasize how, how excited I am that we're going to, you know, do this together and get a zoning amendment into, um, a, a fair housing zoning amendment in and, and how grateful I am to Councillor or Edwards for her leadership and the BPDA um, for showing up with this work today. Uh, and yeah, and that it's just, it's a, it's a great thing to do on Juneteenth. Um, and I can't imagine uh, being anywhere else. So thanks so much, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. And, and I mean, I appreciate that, but I, I, I hope you one day can't imagine being someplace else besides a working session. <laughs> but that aside, uh, Councillor Braden, if you'd like to go next. Thank you, Councillor Ed Edwards. Um, I can't uh, express how excited I am to be here today with you all. Um, I want to particularly thank you for your leadership in this, this area um, and also for the uh, cooperation and, and uh, uh, leadership from the administration side to really get this done. Um, in, in my district, uh, we've seen creeping gentrification and displacement of working people and families and people with disabilities over many, many years. And uh, uh, I ho really hope that this, um, that this uh, amendment to the zoning will, will impact our ability to stabilize our communities and, and have them be inclusive uh, and address so many uh, issues that we've been struggling with for many years. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. 
Councillor Wu. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'm I'm just so excited and energized at this moment that we are. I know it's uh, as many you know as many months as this has been, and letters and community conversations um, for you to take on this push that activists and, and community members have been asking for for a while. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, there's a lot happening over here. Um, just wanted to express total support for this push and also mark that we know this is not the end. <laughs> this is uh, just one step in terms of the council's involvement um, in formally handing this over and, you know, of course, look forward to a, a, an affirmative vote, but that there will be much, much work even after the zoning code is amended to ensure that we are, are, are constantly on the same page about how this translates into actual action for residents and for a city that needs to be um, strong because it includes everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Councillor Flynn? You may, yeah, there you are. Hi, thank, thank you, Councillor Edwards and I just want to echo um, what Councillor Bach mentioned. Um, from my perspective, I want to make sure I strongly support um, this proposal. I want to say thank you to city administration that is here, Sheila Dillon and the, the, the team from um, BPDA as well, um, Mayor Walsh, but I'd also like to recognize and thank Councillor Edwards for really being the strong leader on, on this important issue. My my top concern as it relates to fair housing, I think Councilor Block summed it up. Um, but making making neighborhoods traditionally unavailable for low income families, persons with disabilities, persons with um, uh, com communities of color, but giving them an opportunity, giving them a fair shake to live in some some of these neighborhoods as well. Uh, with the assistance of government. Um, we just can't have various neighborhoods that are um, in cities across the state also, but we just can't have various places that are uh, not limited um, to everybody. So we need to make sure that neighborhoods um, are, are welcoming and are available to low income residents. Um, in, my, in my neighborhood, in my district, I want to make sure Chinatown remains a, a community, a neighborhood of, of immigrants, of, of a place that's always welcoming for um, low-income families. Um, we see great wealth in the city, great buildings going up, and I'm not all impressed by that. I'm impressed about can we give a home or an apartment to an immigrant family or a senior? So that's what I also think about fair housing is, is making sure we treat low-income people, persons with disabilities with the same respect as we do with um, a wealthy developer. So again, just want to say thank you to Councilor Edwards and uh, Mayor Walsh's team for the great work you're doing. Councilor Flaherty. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is obviously a great day for, for the city. Um, obviously, I want to thank um, Chief Dillon and her team, obviously the folks of the BRA, we've done a lot of work. Chief Dillon can attest to the role that the Boston City Council has played uh, in, in the housing space. And I think we're blessed to have uh, two colleagues uh, that have uh, subject matter acumen, uh, their passion and their experience in both the chair, Chair Edwards, and also our newest member, um, Councilor Bach. So that just adds uh, to, uh, I think, our strength as a body. So. It's good to work in partnership with everybody. Uh, there's something here for everyone, which I think is great. I know Council Flynn just talked. He's done a lot of, uh, with the communities and disabilities and, uh, and everything that this uh, legislation uh, is, is meant to do and, and the folks that it's meant to serve will be well served with it. So looking forward to the final product. Glad that we're in a working session, recognizing that we've been at this for a while, but it uh, looks like through the chairs excitement that it looks like there's kind of light at the end of the tunnel and happy to play a role uh, in, uh, in, in all of this uh, over the years. So uh, appreciate it and look forward to hearing more testimony. 
Thank you. Councilor Mejia? Sorry, I'm driving, but thank you. I'm here. Nonetheless, I'm in really super excited to uh, be part of the conversation and grateful to Councilor Edwards for her relentless um, advocacy on ensuring that uh, we center these conversations on equity and making sure that we're not furthering displacing people. For me, everything is personal and, and political and professional and just, um, having been able to take my mom out of Section 8, um, living in Boston, being priced out of every neighborhood that we lived in, um, it, it's time for us to put on paper and, um, and into law how we develop um, because we already know that um, we're not part of the process. And so centering it, and I would love to be able to, once we start getting into the working session, is really thinking about the accountability and the implementation of this and what it's going to look like um for that accountability factor uh to ensure that uh that we are not just as a council but you know everyone who is invested in this is holding themselves accountable to the implementation of this so congratulations to councilor edwards for shepherding this um along the way and making it all happen and happy juneteenth to all my peoples out there looking forward to the dialogue thank you councilor mcgee councilor arroyo and then councilor o'malley I'll keep this short because so much of what I was going to say has been said. Um, you know, happy Juneteenth to everybody. This is a great thing to be working on on Juneteenth. Um, thank you to Lydia Edwards, uh, Chair Edwards, for pushing this through and doing the things that were needed to be done to get this done. So really appreciate that. Really appreciate hearing commitments from the city today. Uh, so, you know, it's a working session, so I'm ready to get to work. Councilor O'Malley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, allow me to add my voice to the chorus uh, of congratulations on your tireless effort and impressive work in this space. Obviously, I am in full support uh, and share the excitement um, that so many previous speakers have uh, have really um, uh, relayed as it relates to this. Um, your work is so important. It's so impressive as we as a body uh, really figure out ways that we can uh, address and deconstruct racism at every level in our city and our society. Um, this is such an important step. What, I, what I'm particularly impressed with with this uh, text amendment in this, in this legislation is that it not only addresses discrimination that we've seen in planning, um, but it also uh, addresses a pathway for real equity and there's actually plans behind it. And that is something that you know, the, the, the nuance there is very, very important um, as we work and strive uh, and, and really do the hard, uh, the hard but important and vital steps um, uh, as, a, as a local governing body. Um, so kudos to you, um, kudos to all of the advocates who have been such a part of it. I, you know, I just look around, just looking through the Zoom pages and see the people you know, with whom we've, we've been having conversations on, on uh, environmental and net zero carbon construction, what that means. And there's always been this, this intersectionality and this real desire to look at things from sort of the complex vantage point that this isn't just, just one thing, this is a hugely important uh, opportunity to address so many of these issues. So I am proud to stand behind you. Uh, grateful for the administration, for their positive comments. Look forward to uh, actualizing this, and this is just the beginning. So well done, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you. Uh, thank you to all the advocates for your incredible work as well. And we've been joined by Council President Kim Janey. Council Janey? Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? You're good. I've been having a few difficulties over here. I just wanted to chime in uh, first by just applauding your leadership, uh, Chairwoman Edwards. Um, your leadership, particularly in this space, housing, development, uh, certainly my colleagues uh, for, for raising important questions and issues. Um, but for me, you know, it, we cannot just do nothing and hope for the best. We know that that perpetuates the status quo and we know what the status quo is. The status quo is built on racist discriminatory practices that has, has 
left uh, many people, uh, particularly residents in our city, out of the opportunity to, to buy a home, to, to even just stay as a renter because it, it's so uh, crazy uh, in our city in terms of these prices. So thank you for your leadership. I think it's a really important conversation. I have not had the opportunity to look at uh, the administration's uh, response, um, but interested in looking at that as well as um, the, the uh, comments from Councillor Bach uh, so that we can move this uh, conversation forward into real action. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And I will just conclude with um, uh, noting to a quick note to my younger self. Um, I'm 24 years old and I just want to tell uh, that younger Lydia, uh, today you found out that the ideal apartment that you wanted, um, that you had your friend go get the application for and show up for and told them they found out that you're a top law student, that you're a great and that you should be in it. And your friend came back and looks incredibly sad and tells you they wanted you until they found out that you were black. And then they said that you can't, it just wouldn't work out with the neighbors. Uh, they didn't want you in the neighborhood. And I'm telling that young Lydia, you wouldn't believe that you're now part of helping to draft <laughs> a zoning amendment to make sure um, that People may not be told that directly, but aren't told that indirectly, that their Section 8 vouchers aren't good here, or that their the building doesn't really accommodate for their bodies, or that we don't have the units for your family size. These are all ways in which you were not directly telling people, but we are telling people that they're not welcome in our neighborhoods, um, that this is just not the best place for them. And I just, zoning has played an unfortunate role in causing a lot of harm and then perpetuating those stereotypes about people and what communities matter and don't matter. And so this is a wonderful step in zoning playing a major role in healing. And I'm so happy about that. So um, we're gonna get to work. We're probably gonna work for the next hour or so. I will um, want to leave some time for some advocates who also may have some suggestions for us um, So uh, to get to it. But if you would like, I, I think I sent out to the group comparison documents and um, we can start literally from the preamble and go through the definitions. Is that okay? Very well. We'll see in the preamble, um, there's not much difference. We both, all of us agree that there should be affirmatively furthering for housing in the very statement and moral compass of the zoning code. Um, there's, I don't know if you guys wanna to speak to the, why the language is different on your part or is there a particular concern? I, I'll say this, do you oppose or are concerned about language that's proposed in the original, lang in the original language? That, that might be more helpful. For those following along, and I see Nadine Cohen has raised her hand, uh, but for those following along, um, we're looking just at the paragraph about the purposes, the preamble. This is for the, I don't know, Sanal, do you have any? Yeah, sure, I'm just trying to make sure I'm at the, on the wrong, I'm at the right document. Um, so I think we, there's a lot of agreement on the preamble um, you know, we wanted to make sure that we included the persons with disabilities um, in our preamble. We included the historical exclusion in our preamble. Um, and we also included the innovative utility services in our preamble. So I want to, you know, it's, I, I, there, we wanted to be sure to encompass the three things that we're proposing in the zoning code. Um, and so I think there's a lot of agreement on the preamble language. Okay. So you guys go further. That's not, uh, I don't, that's not a problem for me. I think the two marry each other very well. Um, Nadine, did you raise your hand specifically to talk about the preamble? Yes, I just wanted to ask, what exactly do you mean by innovative utility services? Um, that that was my question. Sure. Um, Councilor, was we, would you like me to ask the question now? Please. Or please? No, okay. please, go ahead. Yes, of course. So um, innovative utility services, we have had a smart utilities 
uh, policy um, at the BPDA board for some time now. It is a, um, it's on our website. Please take a look at it. Um, I won't get into, into it in much detail here because we only have limited amount of time, but it's a very innovative way to look at how um, energy is delivered um, across the city and especially in, um, in, you know, in in larger areas of our city with larger developments. So that's what we're that's what we're looking at, which is um, and the, that does trigger very innovative ways to look at how energy is consumed and how energy is distributed. So uh, we want to make sure that we are encompassing the smart utilities work in our zoning code as part of this process. I also think there's a point of an issue of equity, and we just saw this actually in COVID right now. Some kids had access to internet, some families did not. And that we, as we are building and moving and zoning, we need to make sure that that's part of the conversation. So I, I really su su firmly support this analysis. And for those who want to ask specific questions, raise your hand, please, like uh, Nadine did. Um, and that includes actually my colleagues, unless I just think it makes the conversation a little bit more smoother. Um, then we get into the major difference is between the proposed language that as filed and then the uh, administration's proposed amendment, um, the definition section. So could you talk me through why, um, is there an opposition to having definitions? I guess that's my first question. And then we can go into if if they need to be changed or something like that. But what's, what's, what's the, because they're, yeah, go ahead. So um, I let I let my colleague Brian Glasscock, who's our zoning expert, answer this in more detail. But in general, there isn't an opposition to definitions. Uh, what 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 you what you saw is a text is a, it's a draft text amendment, and a draft text amendment, um, you know, will be the definitions that will be included in the final will be informed by what's in the final text amendment. So what you had proposed, Councillor Edwards, was you know was a final text amendment, which we were looking to move forward. So it had an entire definition section, et cetera, but we wanted to really work on the meat of the, of the text amendment um, and you know, see this as an opportunity to work through a lot of the issues that we are talking about now, for example. And once we have those, we can get into the definitions, absolutely. So there's no opposition to putting definitions in. We just don't think we're at that point right now because we're still in a working, in a working draft mode. Okay, um, thank you, Sanal. Brian? Yeah, and, and no, it, I, I don't think there's any any uh, substantive ob objection to uh, adding definitions. I think you know, someone else right. We need to work through some of these other issues first. And one of them, one of the challenges um, of uh, adding definitions where you're referencing other legal documents like the Code of Federal, Federal Regulations is, uh, you know, and some, some folks may know this, other may not, but that whole, um, because of the current administration, uh, it's sort of thrown some of that into confusion and it's really hard to, it, it may be a bit of a moving target. And down the road, it's, it makes it challenging when you're, you wanna try and keep our, our zoning regulations current, you have to make sure that you're updating that reference. Um, every time the, the federal regulations change, you need to go back and change our zoning code to make sure it follows the current, uh, you know, the, the current thinking. Uh, sometimes if you get a divergence, then it becomes um, increasingly uh, complicated. So I, I think we can work through that, um, but it's just, it's going to take a little wordsmithing and, and uh, you know, think through uh, potential for unintended consequences. Well, I, I appreciate that. Um, any, any thoughts about the, the proposed things that we want to define so far? I know can Councillor Bach, excuse me, also included historical exclusionary areas as a definition, displacement risk areas. Do you, I mean, do you have any thoughts about these particular things being defined as what I'm trying to get at? Um, I don't think so. Uh, I think the um, assessment of impediments, um, you know, maybe, you know, we may need to do a little more thinking on that one. Um, but the other thing sort of in, in, um, in a broad sense, uh, you know, I think we can come up with uh, definitions that will, that will um, you know, work and, and hold up um, over time. No, I, I, and I completely agree with the analysis that we need to keep it um, defined by us for our communities. Exactly, citing, exactly. Uh, 
federal law that can change depending on how federal the federal government changes can limit or expand our ability to move. Um, so I think we should uh, work on those concrete definitions. For those following but not looking at the document, there are definitions proposed for affirmatively furthering for housing, uh, analysis of impediments, uh, displacement, displacement risk areas, historical exclusion areas, and meaningful actions. These are proposed de de um, definitions um, that come directly from the standard, which is to take meaningful action to overcome patterns of segregation, foster inclusive communities that taken together address significant disparities in housing needs and in access to opportunity or affirmatively furthering for housing. So if I understand this conversation actually may be uh, better left for when we have a, what you say, other things defined, right? Yeah, I think so. Yes. Yeah. And I hear no opposition to the definitions. I see Kenzie's raised her hand, Kenzie. Yeah, I just wanted to say that makes sense to me too. Um, I like, for me, the like I put those additional definitions in and kept the affirmatively furthering for housing one because those were the specific um, terms of art that I was using in my like draft suggestions further down. Um, and I think similarly, Councillor Edwards, that in your text you use analysis of impediments at one point or a couple points, and so therefore it makes sense to define it. So it does. It makes sense to me from a drafting perspective that we really need to figure out what the body language looks like and then make sure that and then figure out, well, what are the terms of art that we're using um, that need to be defined further up? Yeah. Um, and, and I also just wanted to say while I'm on uh, that, I, I think that um, what the administration suggested on the preamble front is more, is, uh, is, is clearer and broader and I would be supportive of that, so thanks. Yeah, no, I agree. I just wanna point out that I think it's important that you know, we look at the definitions uh, very carefully um, as we're moving forward. So, you know, I, we agree that we, there should be definitions in, in two, um, but let's look at those, let's look at those as well as we move forward. Agreed. Um, I think the next major bucket beyond the definitions is um, the looking at the zoning text and requirements in zoning, um, specifically when it comes to the PDA. If you wanna actually, before we go into that technical stuff, I think what would be great is if you break down the two addition, additional points of analysis, uh, that is for the small project review and for the utilities. I, I, I firmly think those are, those are great ideas, but tell me a little bit about those. Um, uh, Sonal, do you want me to, to take a crack at that? Oh, that'd be great, thank you, Ryan. Sure. So, um, yeah, I, you know, I, I know we're, we've been focused on the FFH, but I, I, I do kind of want to, and I, I think people have uh, recognized the accessibility the, and the uh, critical connection between accessibility and fair housing. And um, I realize that the smart utilities one, you know, seems like it sort of comes out of left, left field a little bit, but uh, we, we have a model that we've been um, uh, successfully implementing for both uh, accessibility and smart utilities for, for some time now um, that has, has worked really well. The, the smart utilities um, was sort of came out of the fact that, you know, whenever we have a uh, development projects, there's a lot of digging up of the streets and they're, they're tearing up the, you know, developers are tearing up the, the public way. We realize there's an opportunity there to uh, get additional infrastructure put in so that we can have um, you know, what they call shadow conduit. So you can add more fiber optic down the road without having to tear up the road. Uh, and we heard over and over again from you know, small businesses and residents alike that this constant state of construction, road construction, um, you know, is just is crushing them. So we thought there's gotta be a better, smarter way. So uh, this joins with our city's COBUX program where we're doing really thoughtful, progressive, uh, forward thinking, planning around utility and infrastructure uh, so that we can have smart streets, so we can have, uh, you know, better, better and more varied options to, uh, to data connect, uh, connections and, and uh, the internet uh, for everybody. 
um, you know, rather than keep tearing up our streets. So, you know, this is geared, that's geared towards larger projects. And so we thought that should be in here as well. We've had a, a checklist for some time that's been adopted by the board that we make uh, developers go through. So that's, that's, that was that piece. Um, uh, I think the, on the uh, small project uh, piece of it, um, you know, we realized that, you know, small projects uh, do have, uh, do have some impacts. Um, you know, they're, they're a little more subtle, but the fact that the, the sheer number of small projects is so much greater than, than, the, than the really big projects that we wanted to start capturing that information. And we think it's uh, not unreasonable to make uh, small project proponents, some of whom are maybe this is the one-off project. They, they're not, they don't do this all the time in the city of Boston, like some of the larger developers, but we thought it was still um, reasonable to ask them, uh, you know, these, these tough questions about, you know, um, who they are and what's the development project and um, what's on the site now and have they thought through, you know, the impacts uh, to the, you know, businesses and people that are, that are on these development sites. So um, it's, it's um, uh, not, not as, it, it's not onerous enough to, um, uh, you know, we think to, to uh, kill projects, um, but it does get us some, some critical insight into the impacts of these smaller projects. And then on the on the PDA front, um, you know, one of the things that was um, sort of tough to work out about this is um, virtually all planned development. Before you go there, there was yeah. a third category that you also added, and that was for small business analysis, which I thought was great. Oh, yes, um, I thank didn't you. Mentioned that before, but I think I, I think you should. There's three major differences that yeah. actually I think bring that was the small util uh, the utilities, small projects, and the fact that you want small business displacement or just impacts to be also included. Could you speak to why? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, you know, one of the things that gives our neighborhoods characters is the small local businesses. And, you know, uh, that's one of the, the casualties of, of uh, uh, redevelop, neighborhood redevelopment. Uh, sometimes it's these small uh, businesses. So a project comes in, redevelops a site, but the, the small business who's displaced can't now afford that same space that they were in before on the on the same block because of construction costs and you know site acquisition costs the rents that are going to be demanded by uh you know by the uh, developers are going to be out of reach for for a lot of these small businesses so you know we every time we you know some beloved small institution um you know goes away we all feel really bad because that's part of what we love about living in boston and this is a way of of doing that analysis, trying to figure out, you know, how how can we make it possible for a small business that's located on a development site to come back into that same space and continue to serve the neighborhood? Um, and I don't I don't know that anybody has been, um, you know, in, in the country has been super successful at this, but you know, we're going to give it a give it a try, and we think this is the tool to get us there. Thank you. Um, did, did, did you want to talk about the PDAs yet or or I have a question from my colleague uh, Liz Braden. Go ahead, Liz. It's it's more of a comment with regard to the small business analysis. And in, in, in my district, we have had lots of um, areas in the district that were zoned for uh, light industrial, and they're all being redeveloped as residential. And that is squeezing out the opportunity for uh, squeezing out small businesses and leaving no space for small businesses in our in our neighborhood. So that's another concern uh, about the impacts of rezoning um, with regard to replacing um, light industrial areas with um, residential. Um, and it's, I think it's something that needs to be weighed into thinking about uh, these issues going forward. Thank you. Councilor Braden, I think I want to make sure before we go into the PDA that we do so we do have a commitment then for definitions to be in the final text amendment. Yes. Okay. And so, uh, and we're we're going to do our best not to simply cite to um, outside uh, statutes. We're going to actually create those definitions ourselves. I think that makes the makes the most sense, and and I think we can we can tailor something that's, you know, really specific to Boston that's gonna that's gonna have some staying power and not uh, not add confusion, but actually add clarity. 
Excellent. And I just want to note for a lot of folks um, or things that I'll be looking for um, is that we really try to make it based on current or these, uh, the affirmatively furthering for housing definitions uh, per the Obama administration's uh, attempt at uh, putting those definitions out there. I think it's really important um, and using that as, as a, as a, as the guidepost. I also think in terms of protected class, we shouldn't forget that the Human Rights Commission, that law that we have for the city of Boston actually includes more protected classes, as we know, right? Parents, for example, are protected class under that um, income. Uh, folks, uh, whether how you are paid, whether it's Section 8 or whether it's through a food stamp, that's a protected class. There's a lot more creativity. So I, I think we should be um, making sure we include the most as a standard, the, the the law with the most protected classes. Councilor Mejia? Councilor Mejia? Raise your hand. Okay. Councilor Mejia? Maybe she needs to be let in. Yeah, I think that's, she's in attendees. Okay. Okay. Very well. She must have gotten off it. Very well. Um, so um, I feel like I've been upgraded to the status of being inside the halls of power. So I don't know if, everybody, if you guys can hear me. We can hear you. Okay, good. I'm glad that I got let in. Thank you. Um, so I do just have a quick question around, um, I'm wondering if there's any room, whereas in the class to be a little bit more mindful of Boston specific history as it relates to redlining and segregation. You know, just because, you know, having grown up during the busing era and neighborhoods being regulated to certain places, um, I, I, I think that we have an opportunity to kind of be really thoughtful about uh, segregation issues here. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if, if there's some room for the text amendment to be, um, uh, you know, tweaked a little bit more around just the issue around segre segregated housing and, and redlining. Yeah. Yeah. That was already addressed on. No, no, no. I said, I see you, Tim, because Tim had raised his hand while you were talking. My apologies, Councilor Mejia. Okay, no, because I'm having some technical difficulties today, so I can't see anybody as long as. Um, and then uh, I do have um, some other things to consider and just wanted to know whether or not um, it's great that there's a plan in place to promote community development through the BPDA by incentivizing developers to include child care and career development and climate resiliency, et cetera. But I'm also curious to know what can we do to uplift developers who are already operating in the mindset of furthering fair housing. I feel like some, some folks do a great job and others need a little bit of more handholding. Um, so just curious about what that would look like. Um, and then, in regards uh, to the definition, I'm just curious, what plans are there to involve the community um, in defining uh, what affirmatively furthering fair housing means? I, I just feel like, I'll just speak for myself, these are oftentimes I'm Googling half the things that I'm hearing about just so that I'm clear on it. And affirmatively, I'm, I'm assuming it means uh, yes and positively, <laughs> but I'm just curious what opportunities exist to kind of, if, the, if this is the language that we're defining it as, are there ways to kind of break it down so that everybody understands and, and is able to really clearly understand what this means? Um, I'm gonna take a crack at some of the responses, Tim, and then turn it over to you. Um, starting with your last question and going back, um, Council Mejia, we've been blessed to have uh, an affirmatively furthering for housing task force made up of the community from ACE, from Greater Boston Legal Services, from all uh, many different organizations who and professors who have been dedicated for three years and actually helping to define what that is. And they have seen this amendment, they actually recommended the am amendment, have seen this uh, and will continue to be part of the defining and working on the language in this amendment. So um, that's been one thing. Um, Can you hear with, from with me regards, I'm just curious, like affirmatively means like positively, like what does that mean? I'm just, I'm so sorry. No, it's, it's quite all right. Um, we're using specific language that is in the statute that created it. 
on purpose and affirmatively does mean to yes to take meaningful actions to do more than just not discriminate okay well then that's all yeah. i need to hear i see you councillor bach i'm going to uh, continue to answer and then i will turn it over to him and then turn it over to councillor bach with regards to how you uplift or move within developers that's what a lot of the checklists or the implementation documents will be doing um, this is where we're looking at the zoning text, but in order to actually make it come to life, they will have to be filling out documents saying what they are doing for a part of their approval process. So, the, so, so what those documents look like and how they're checking, are you helping childcare? Are you doing all these different things? We will be, we are, we have agreed to, that is a massive conversation about the checklists and how they're going to be dealing with those and how they're going to be looked and assessed. And so this working session, will talk with some of the zoning, the bones, if you will, of what is and is not going to be in there. And so far we've agreed on majority of what should be in there, including definitions, preamble, things like that. How it gets done, those documents, we probably won't be able to get to just today, but that does involve and has involved the community from day one and those checklists. They are massive. Well, and would that be public once we have, will we create a dashboard so we can track all of this? Happy to. I think what's really important is also having continued working sessions just about the documents publicly and, and, and inclusively. And then um, in terms of the historical, uh, the, how this zoning amendment does account for the historical ways in which people have been redlined, discriminated against, um, I will probably turn this over to Tim, but I think that's where we're trying to get within the historical exclusion zones and the definition. But that's my opinion. Uh, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Tim Davis and then Councillor Bach, I believe, also had some uh, response. Thank you. Yes, uh, this is Tim Davis from the Department of Neighborhood Development. Um, in support of and following on Councillor Mejia's question about looking at patterns of segregation and redlining, yes, uh, one of the goals will be this would be something that would be developed between D and D and BPDA research is to look at um, areas of historic e exclusion um, of protected classes. And so that uh, there are, um, there's, we don't necessarily want to set up a system where we're creating new red lines, but we do want to have a tool that really shows us what areas of the city um, have been areas of historic exclusion um, so that we can, working with developers, say, okay, so your development is in this kind of area. What are the important features that you're going to do to try to make this neighborhood more diverse? Um, and the same is true. And so kind of on the opposite side of the coin is looking at a displacement risk and assessment, which is another tool that we'll be developing and in some ways are already beginning that process. And as uh, some of the counselors are aware, there's a number of of uh, people and academics who are working on similar processes um, and thoughts that we'll be following up on to create a tool so we can also identify those areas to use as uh, a companion with the um, development assessment uh, so that we can get a better sense of what's happening development by development. Thank you. I, I do have another question, Tim, to follow up on that before we go. Is that okay, uh, Madam Chair? Can I just do a follow-up? No, I can't. She's muted, so I'd say go ahead. Muted. <laughs> I'm talking to nobody. <laughs> I was saying, uh, I think I want to have counsel, give Councillor Bach the opportunity to respond to your first question, Councillor Mejia. Yeah. And then if you have a follow-up for Councillor, now you're promoted, Tim, or demoted, depending on how you see the council, um, to, um, to Tim, then we'll go back between that exchange. Okay? Councillor Bach. Yeah, thanks so much. I'll be quick. Um, Councillor Mejia, um, one thing about affirmatively furthering fair housing, because you're right, right? It's a catchphrase, and it's sort of like a policy phrase, and, and people are like, well, what does it mean? Um, and I, and I think you make a good point there about kind of accessibility to folks. I think the reason it's really important to use that catchphrase and why advocates and like Councilor Edwards mentioned, um, the community like has been using it is because it's a phrase that's in the original 1968 Fair Housing Act. 
that actually is supposed to obligate the government to do more than it's not just that because of the Fair Housing Act, you can no longer redline and discriminate. And so you need to prove you aren't discriminating against people. It's that you actually have a duty to affirmatively further fair housing, which is to like proactively try to counter these segregating trends, not trends, I mean, actions, right, that the government took. Um, and so the reason why there's so much emphasis on that phrase is because what the Obama administration in 2015 did was highlight the fact that like HUD had never taken seriously enforcing the affirmative proactive piece of the law and that they were trying to encourage folks to now do that. Um, and then of course the Trump administration immediately got in and started rolling that back. But what the city, what we're all trying to do is continue to commit the city um, in a like more, you know, a more substantive zoning code based way than ever before to like really do that proactive affirmative work. So I think it's just important to know that that's the sort of history of that phrase. It goes all the way back to the 1968 law. Um, and that's why I think it's worth using, even though you're right, that also we need ways of talking about this work that our plain language and make people understand that it's about, you know, that it's about desegregating the city and giving everybody access to all parts of the city. Um, so I just wanted to enter that comment and then just also say um, that my office has been doing a bunch of work and I'll shout out Emily Brown, my policy director, um, just think like also thinking a bit about um, what's the kind of way that you think from a data analysis perspective about both these historical exclusion zones and uh, the displacement risk zone, risk areas. And I I took a lot of in the weeds detail of that out of my memo because it was gonna be like 20 pages instead of nine, um, but looking forward to continuing to collaborate on those fronts um, with uh, d and and BPDA and all the counselors. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And this is a working session. So this is an opportunity for us to learn and listen and participate, right? So some of these might just be things that I should have known, but I don't, so sorry. I'm just gonna ask anyways, is that, you know, I look at the seaport and I look at downtown and I look at how the patterns are and even looking at Dorchester, there's certain parts of Dorchester that I can't even put a toe in because I can't even afford to even consider even living there ever. So as you all are thinking about this uh, amendment and, and planning, are we looking at also how uh, affordable things are in certain neighborhoods? Is, is that, and I may have missed that part Yes. Yes, that would that would be part of the analysis. Yes, that would be definitely part of the analysis. Yes. Yes, because I think that that's really important to look at at, at that all those patterns because I think those are also tied into schools um, because where you live dictates what where you might go to school and I think that there's there's an intersection here around some of the patterns that we're seeing in in higher higher uh, performing schools and not so much so so I just think that those things need to be kind of uh, lifted up in this process. And then the last thing, and this is more of a, um, th th these things have already happened to people who have been displaced. There are a lot of people who are living in Brockton and Stoughton and Randolph, because, but they're still working in Boston um, and having to travel here. And I think that um, it's as a result of not furthering, uh, affirmatively furthering of fair housing practices. Um, and it's not about going back and restoring the wrong, you know, and righting the wrong. It's just really about making sure that we understand the financial impact that we have made, that we have uh, made on others who can't live here anymore, but still have to work here. I just want to just throw that out because as I think about this work, it's, it's how do we resolve this in a way that, um, prevents that from happening again. That's it. Just wanted to just babble on some more just because I like to babble. But thank you. I will just yield the rest of my time. And that's it. And we can't hear you. Not a problem, Councilor Mejia. I think your your points are are valid and also our our guideposts, scalp guideposts, excuse me, for how this will really be real to most people in Boston. So I think you, all you've done is give us a checklist of things that you need to see accounted for in an amendment that you would support. That's great. So thank you. Um, uh, at this time, I wanted to, so we've, we've discussed kind of in groups, the major differences. I would say the biggest difference uh, between 
the uh, proposed amendment and the one I, I proposed and the one the BPDA is also proposing is um, how we approach the zoning code when it comes to PDAs. And we were gonna talk about that shortly. Um, the biggest difference is uh, I put the language in to the PDA about what I think should be the affirmatively furthering for housing duties when we're looking at the PDAs are, are uh, planning development areas. And the BPDA's major differences, they don't, I don't think disagree with that analysis, but they put it in documents and how to like the implementation. So checklists of which we would be looking at for the P PDA. I, 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 I kind of stand pretty firm and I, I want it in the law um, and not only in supplement, sub subsequent documents. And that's the major difference. I also think it's very important that our law, the zoning law also account for and require an equity lens when we're talking about mitigation. Too many developers come in to communities and shell out hundreds, thousands, sometimes millions of dollars in mitigation, often defined by a small group of people in the IAG. And there seems to be no equity analysis for that money. So it's twofold for why I think mitigation and PDAs need to have the specific equity lens in the zoning code. And I don't know if that's, if you are in opposition to that, that's one thing. And then the second part is, um, you know, it seems like, again, you, you have analysis and checklists, but not the zoning code change. I don't know if anyone wants to respond to that. Well, um, I'll take a. Um, I'll start off, but I encourage my colleagues to to, to jump in as well. Um, I don't think there's an op opposition to that. I, I think it's um, you know I my sort of view on um, adding specifics about um, the PDAs was that you know we have um, so just for the benefit of folks that aren't that don't work on zoning all the time, plan development area uh, essentially says that if you have a site that's one acre or larger. Uh, in some parts of the city, not all parts of the city, but um, but in each neighborhood, um, there are specific areas where plan development area uh, designations allowed. If you've got an acre, one acre site, um, we can set aside the underlying zoning because there's not very many one acre sites um, available in the city anymore. And we think there's an opportunity there to uh, do development in a different way uh, that uh, allows us to get um, additional inclusionary development units additional uh, public amenities like open space, uh, improvements to uh, the public realm, the streets and sidewalks. Essentially, it sort of sets aside uh, the underlying zoning and allows us to work as a community and as a city uh, to think through what's the, what's the best kind of development we can get out of this. And uh, it does also allow for developers to, uh, uh, to build, build higher and denser and uh, it's how the city is then able to uh, you know, share in that additional value so that we get these public uh, benefits like uh, deeper inclusionary uh, development uh, participation. The, uh, but with each neighborhood, plan development areas have different um, sets of parameters. We've been restricting it um, you know, by height in some neighborhoods or by height and FAR, or sometimes just by FAR, sometimes by use if we're trying to uh, promote a particular type of, of use. Um, uh, so it's really tough to be super specific about all PDAs everywhere um, without some sort of planning document that goes along with it. And I, I think tailoring uh, the requirements of plan development areas through the lens of, of um, you know, the uh, availability uh, of affordable housing in a particular neighborhood, uh, you know, housing costs, um, the, you know, the, they'll have differential rates of, of uh, risk for displacement, uh, as well as historic uh, exclusion. So I, I, I absolutely agree that, that uh, there are some things that, um, you know, we can be very specific about in PDAs, but I think it needs to be done through the, through the lens of a planning context on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis, 
we, we can't sort of broad broad brush the whole whole city with the same set of of uh, requirements. But I'm glad to you know um, glad to open up to my colleagues because um, they may have uh, additional thoughts on that. I think, if I may, I think the goal was to have PDAs do three things, right? One, that there has to be an assessment for fair housing when we're talking about the PDA. As Brian noted, what's very unique about this is that you're allowed to set all new zoning within an area. It allows for, you know, for, and, and why is that important? Oftentimes, because we're not talking about a house or a building, we're talking about and we're also talking about sometimes over multiple years of development, am I correct, and planning. So it's important sometimes to have, uh, as developers want, predictability over that time. They want to know what the votability will be, how much, how big they can go, how small they can go. They want to know the parameters because economies change, administrations change, but they want they want that clarity. So, so that is why I feel part of the job of this zoning code should require that not only clarity about you know, density and height, but also measures for assessing compliance with fair housing and amend, you know, and requiring them to do that. So that's one thing, especially if it's multi-phase. And then the other thing I want them to do is um, I want to analyze the project's compliance overall with the affirmatively further fair housing and its mitigation that it's gonna provide. So I, I want those things as requirements in the code for PDAs because again, Oftentimes, this is by virtue of any planning department, any planning, it, you're just not going to be there on a day to day basis with this, right? Sometimes some of you won't even be working for the city by the time the project is over with, right? I mean, well, some of you will never leave, but that's a good thing, love and dedication, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but, but in many cases, I want to see the zoning code reflect that that for PDAs, there's an equal dedication to this type of analysis. I 100% support the subsequent documents that you have said that we need as assessment tools, but the language and the requirement and the moral compass is in the law. And then how it gets done is in the assessment tools that we're going to create. So that's why I'm really committed to having that in the PDA law as we outline what they can and cannot do. Um, and then finally, um, I also outline a process for um, in the PDA for public engagement, which I think is very important. And Councilor Mejia touched on a little bit, but how the process is and how inclusive it is, is equally as important to the end result. So that's why I wanted to make sure when we're talking about who's at the table, how much money and stuff is provided and overall their commitment um, because they have to sign a document to it. That's why I want that in the PDA specific language. So, so totally understand that, uh, Councillor Edwards. Um, I think I think we can work on the specific language. Um, you know, I, I, we hear what you're saying on wanting to put in the PDA language. Uh, we actually put in our cover letter to you or cover memo to you. Um, you know, we've been talking about a reporting mechanism for PDAs, which are multi-phased. As Brian mentioned, uh, you know, PDAs apply to uh, pro uh, sites that are one acre or above, not all, not all, all over the city, but in um, parts of the city. Um, some of them only have one project; they only have one building. Some of them are are, are really, really huge, and they have multi-projects, multi-phase projects. And so, you know, we we are very. Um, uh, we're looking forward to having some sort of reporting mechanism in PDAs uh, because I think that's important for for the public. It's important for us. It's important for the developer, um, you know, to make sure that we're keeping their commitments to board. So some sort of reporting mechanism. We are, we're not there yet because we're literally just working through these documents. But a reporting mechanism is something that we would definitely be looking at. Uh, I also want to address your uh, public engagement uh, piece. Um, I think I think what the, your language said was a response to a written response to comments received. Here. Something slash something comma in aggregate. And sorry, I don't have it memorized. <laughs> it's not in front of me. Um, but that's you know, so written comments received three days before a public hearing. Is that am I correct in that? 
better than me. I can go get the language. But I, I'm talking about the the goals of having it in the in the PDA. So yeah. much, not so much the specific. I'll, I'll grab it. One second. And I see Kenzie Box raised her hand. I don't know, Kenzie, if you wanted to go ahead while I find the language. Um. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I um. I have the language also, if you guys want it in front of me. Um, yeah, it was three business days. Yeah, yeah. If, if Sanal wants to finish her point on that front, I'm, and then I can come in, because I was gonna come in on a slightly different point, PDA related. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, so I, I think, I think th those, are, those are great goals. Um, we've so spoken about, about them um, internally. I think, you know, where they belong, do they belong in a PDA, in a, in a zoning code? or in a separate uh, policy document. Um, so, you know, full transparency, ability to respond to comments before we go take it, take uh, PDAs to the board are all really, really uh, important. Um, but I, I'm, I'm, we're still kind of going back and forth between what goes in the zoning code and then what can be in a scaffolding document as Councillor Bach has mentioned earlier. Councillor. Um, go ahead, Councillor Bach, and then I will um, go, ahead. go ahead. Sure. I was just going to say this is, um, I think, related to maybe Councillor Edwards' second point on the PDAs. Um, it's just, I do think, and I know, I mean, it's not here yet. I think I think it's somewhere like we should try to get to is, um, and, and I think folks have heard me say this before, um, but PDAs, are a place where we as a city are usually creating value by um, up zoning in some context um, or at least making it making the zoning you know conducive to whatever often a private proponent wants to achieve um, and so because of that I think there's really an opportunity on the um, affirmatively furthering fair housing front to have like kind of a higher bar in terms of what we're asking so I do want to see us putting something in that isn't just you know oh for a pda we also do this assessment but is a little more prescriptive about um and like you know we're really you're really gonna like follow up with like your as Councilor Edwards was saying part of your mitigation package is related to these fair housing purposes and i mean and i want and folks can see in my draft that i think they're um i mean i suggested a mechanism for that a kind of interagency um fair housing committee um which was modeled on the green building committee that's not something that exists today um to kind of you know help gut check those types of plans and make some kind of recommendation to the board um certainly i'm flexible again on the scaffolding of that but i do think that pdas are where we have when we talk about the opportunity to affirmatively further fair housing to do something proactive they're where as a city we have um some of the greatest opportunity so i i think i think that's something we should try to we should try to get to an agreement on So I would say Thank we're not, you. we don't, I would say that what we're really talking about is, um, again, I think heading in this somewhat same direction where that language belongs, right? Somewhat, uh, I think the BPDA is looking at it being part of an assessment tool for PDAs. And I, I'm saying it should be part of the, the standards set for approval in the PDA language that again I, I would summarize not my language but the goals of the language I put in one that the um, in the statement and purpose section almost like a preamble that we require the development uh, review process includes meaningful actions the second part um, and this is be an 80 dash a5 again not going through all the language but requiring the applicants seeking article 80 approval and the BPDA to submit an agreement showing compliance with fair housing laws and affirmatively furthering fair housing provisions. In section 80B3, um, this is on large project review, um, ensure that the context of the reports created uh, include explanation of fair housing principles. Um, let's see, on the 80C4, ensures that the approval process for the PDA includes a decision that the plan complies with, facilitates and advances fair housing goals. And then I'm gonna find where the mitigation, I think it's on 
I also put in a requirement that an ADC5, that there's a cert certification of fair housing from city agencies that you, the city may designate. So DND, fair housing, so on and so forth can look at it. And it's, it may seem overly burdensome, but I'll just remind the folks, PDAs, again, are setting their own internal zoning. So this is why we need to be, I think, particularly aggressive in that moment. Um, and PDAs could sometimes take a year or more to approve. Um, an article or section 80C7 ensure that the PDA uh, plan is, is only approved if it complies with the city's obligations. So I think it's, I'm trying to really limit um, or look at the approval process being directly connected. Um, and then I wanna say mitigation, I put in article, let's see, or section, let's see, uh, I think it's 80, is that the process for engagement? 80B3, also requiring that there be um, an analysis of the, uh, the mitigation and benefits, public benefits that are put through and making sure that's equitable. And again, for me, because PDAs are zoning within zoning, I'm just literally the same things that we felt important for the entire zoning code, I want to also see replicated in PDAs. One, I actually think this is an and, not an or. It's what you have proposed for assessment tools and this language is what I am, I am su suggesting or some version of the language that deals with these issues within the PDA. Um, let's see. We've already discussed, and I think it's great, the small project review and also the utilities review um, and small business, which I, I, I wonder if it makes sense to maybe agree to a definition of small business for purposes of this act and zoning. I 100% think their displacement should be analyzed. The other major crux or huge difference is I have a whole section dedicated to East Boston, not just because I live there. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, no, 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 not just because I favor my neighborhood, all three of them, um, but uh, because I want to know, I wanted to explain what the mindset was because I don't think you guys included a whole section on 53, right? And I think the reason why is because when we first introduced this, this was in April of 2019, and we were not sure how or when the approval for Suffolk would happen. So we thought that it would have to be, you know, if you approved it, right, without this, then it would only apply retroactively in terms of amendments. And that's what we were trying to do. Suffolk hasn't been approved yet. Um, and so there might be a way to get that approval for certain standards in our compromise zoning for Suffolk without it having to have its own separate section. East Boston, that, that is, so that was a timing thing. Thank you, we appreciate that. So, you know, ideally we get full on agreement to certain of our compromise understandings and there's certain documents that uh, the developer will have to com commit to for, to for affirmatively further for housing. And if that can happen as the process, then I think that that prevents an entire section just dedicated to one neighborhood. And I understand uh, why that looks awkward. And, you know, every single one of us represents a neighborhood that, you know, <laughs> Kenzie is like, why does East Boston get this special treatment? Why is this? But that was why, that was why. Um, those are the major cruxes and differences I find. I was going to turn over to, I see Sheila's raised her hand. And then I was going to turn over to some folks in the uh, who are also in the audience who may have questions, suggestions, or things that they want us to absolutely consider. I don't think it makes sense to go into the documents for assessment tools right now, um, because I, I just think that that's going to require another working session. Dila? Yeah, so um, thank you. It's been a good conversation so far. Um, I just, before we, we leave the PDA section, and I, I think that the administration is certainly open to 
um, going back and looking and editing and, and, and finding common ground. The BPDA's PDA language, I, I just personally really like. It was clear. I think it was, it was, it was bordering on inspirational. You know, it just, I don't know, I felt really very, very happy when I read it. And, and so I, when, I don't want to lose the spirit of it, even as we add to it. I think it really was almost visionary um, about how to ha the PDA language, the BPDA's PDA language. Wanna so, read it? What's that? You want to read it? I mean, uh, sure. Um, go ahead. In a, in, a, in a PDA, the proponent shall engage in a process that takes into consideration the city's goals to affirmatively further fair housing by providing thoughtful analysis of direct and potential indirect displacement. And it goes on. Um, but it just, it calls out, you know, what, what we hope to achieve, you know, creating or contributing to an integrated and inclusive neighborhood by providing deeper residential and commercial affordability, a diversity of housing types, you know, to accommodate families. I just think it's, um, it, it, anyone picking it up would, would be able to sort of read it and Anyways, I, I just, when we go back and forth, I just don't want to lose the clarity of it. So that would be um, for ADC. And I think that was, was that part of the scope and the, the introduction to the PDA? The administration, I, I think it's excellent language. I don't- It's in the PDA, it's in the PDA in the text amendment. Yeah, it, it, it would, it's adding a section uh, three after uh, paragraph two, which says PDA master plans. The, it would add up uh, two more paragraphs, uh, three PDA master plans and development plans. And, um, uh, essentially, you know, saying not only do you have to go through the same, um, so to backtrack just a bit, m virtually all PDAs will have to go through Article 80 large project review just by definition. But we felt that um, in PDAs, because of their size, because of the fact that, as you point out, it's essentially sort of an upzoning, uh, there's an opportunity to, to dig a little deeper. Um, and so this sort of sets out how, how we would approach that, um, holding them to a higher standard, um, also recognizing uh, you know, that, that um, where they do overachieve you know, beyond you know, what would otherwise be, re be required, uh, you know, we need to we need to value that and and, and appreciate it. Um, so it's it's sort of giving direction that you can't come in just you know with the bare minimum. We're going to expect a lot more. Excellent. So it's a new section or amending that section specifically. Okay. Yeah, and it's 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 a it's a chunk of of verbiage there, but um, uh, it, it's necessary to to fully express you know what what we're expecting. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, folks who have attended, who are are, who may want to have comments, suggestions, questions, who are in the audience, or by that I mean are not not an elected or an administrative person. Does anyone have any questions? Does anyone is, is anyone still awake? <laughs> Just me, Kenzie, and, and, she, and yeah, all of us are riveting. Lincoln, you have to have a thought. I can't imagine you don't have thoughts. <laughs> Sarah, I can't imagine. Nadine, are you kidding me? You're just so enthralled and amazed and excited, right? I think uh, Nadine's uh, uh, go on to Nadine. Oh, Nadine, go, yeah, go ahead, Nadine. Nadine can go. But go ahead, Nadine. I, I was just going to say that. Um, I, I think this is very encouraging. I think we still have some work to do, but I wonder if there has been any thought about some kind of outside review of um, how this gets implemented. Um, having been around the block a few times, <laughs> I've seen some really great plans uh, be developed and then in the implementation, it doesn't always work as well as we anticipated. So I would love to see some process built in to review um, how this is working down the road. 
I appreciate that. I think I think that's a, a an absolute conversation for a working session dedicated to how it gets done and who's going to enforce it. I know part of that conversation is whether we should have an outside auditor um, or some sort of fair client fair. Someone has suggested a fair fair housing compliance kind of audit. Sorry, not necessarily an auditor, but someone who does does pulls back and does an analysis. But I think that 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 has directly connected to the documents and assessment tools we're going to be creating. Um, Lincoln, and then I see Angela Williams. Yeah. So so uh, first of all, I just um, want to echo some of what have been said already by just recognizing where we are, and um, certainly it's been a long time coming that we are here. Is I think is a is a is a really a big victory for the city of Boston. Um, to be quite frank, um, when I want to recognize so many people who kind of got us to this place, obviously, um, uh, Councilor Edwards, and but also for the for the administration for taking this step. Um, there's been dialogue around around um, you know amendment uh, having fair fair housing to zoning for for a, a period of time, and you know so s somewhere along the line the decision. Had to have been made that this that you know this is we can all coalesce around this idea, so I, I want to recognize the um the city around that. I also want to say that um this is very very encouraging for the members of the of the affirmatively for the Fair Housing Community Advisory Committee. Um, I, I I will say as we work further uh, through this and other aspects of of, uh, of the plan, there are some additional pieces around around zoning, not specifically around the zoning amendment that we'll be having um, a deeper conversations with the city around to kind of flesh this out further. But I think the point Nadine just made about having this outside this entity to, to kind of assess and, and, and work with through that, I think is a good idea. But I just want to recognize um, us for being at this place today. And also, can I also recognize uh, one, one city partner in particular? Uh, it's always bad doing this because people are going to be like, well, why didn't he recognize um, me? But I, but I, but I, I really want to want to recognize Sheila because I think Sheila has been been with us through this for throughout this uh, this whole CSC CSC process, and um, I think DND in particular is one of those agencies that get they get beat up a lot beat up a lot in the in in the community around processes like these. But I think Sheila has been committed to this for a long time. So I I, I want to recognize you, Sheila, for for hanging in there and and and, and staying with us through this process. But uh, thank thank everyone for all the hard work they've done around us, really appreciate it. Thank you, I have Angela and then I have Hajar. Good morning, oh good, yes, good morning, good morning everyone. Happy June 19th. Um, my, um, Nadine has addressed one of my concerns which had to do with the implementation, the oversight and the enforcement of um, everything that's being talked about today, the tools, which is bloody awesome. Lincoln has framed it well. A lot of work and thoughts have gone, gone into this, people's time, patient, energy, so on and so forth. But without, you know, without those additional, you know, tools, the implementation, the oversight and the enforcement, um, it doesn't go very far. So for that, thank you, Nadine, for bringing that up. I have another question or concern as it relates to um, housing. Um, individuals being able to um, get their pathway to equity. Cliff effect, I haven't heard anyone talk about that. And cliff effect becomes very important when someone has a unit that may be um, whether it's section eight or, and um, I'm having a senior moment right this minute because the language is escaping me um, in terms of the unit being, being um, uh, income restricted. If a, if a person is going to school, it has a job and they're gonna be promoted or get their pay raise increased and they're getting subsidy, the cliff effect have a way of either holding them hostage where they can't economically improve themselves or should they try to do so, it has an adverse effect on them. So I'd like to know, has, has the city 
thought of a pilot program to actually okay. um, deep dive into this to see how we can actually help our residents um, from point A to point B so that they can become um, economically uh, independent without having to lose all their benefits one time. That's Thank it. you. Thank you very much. I do think that um, that's an excellent question. Um, I don't know that the zoning code can address that, but I do think that there is there are several that I've heard this before specifically about how people as they grow in income, the gap or their subsidy could go away is really what I'm hearing from from her and or their income restricted limb, uh, units become uh, for many people or for, and a life restrictive unit because they feel that they, if they advance too much or get too much income. And I think that that uh, again, may not be addressed in this zoning code, but I see Sheila nodding um, and I've, I've heard of other programs working family compass and some other things and maybe Kenzie or Kate can talk about programs uh, as people were growing and many did in the BHA and as you know, so I don't know if any, anyone wants to take that on. I see Julia has her hand raised, but I will come back to her. So I'm acknowledging that. Go ahead, uh, Councillor. Um, Councillor Dillon now, in case you were curious, you were elected recently, uh, uh, Sheila Dillon. So no, I, I think you're raising a really good point. And, and you know, I, I've heard this a lot too over the years that as people um, get job promotions or, or you know, find they're making more money than, than more of their money gets paid into, or they become ineligible for their, for their section eight or their, or their unit. And is, if Kate's still on, or because I think, you know, the BHA is not a moving to work agency, but there are, there have been programs in other cities and towns where if you make additional money, instead of paying that additional money into the housing authority, um, that that money is saved for you so you can further education or buy a home, et cetera. So I think you raise a really good point and we could certainly look at that. And I don't know if Kate's still on, I know there's a budget meeting as well, but um, I'd be glad to follow up. Thank you. I'm gonna, because of time, I'm gonna go on to Hajar, then Councillor Mejia raised her hand and then Councillor Bach. Hajar? Get off of mute. Let me see if I can help you. Oh, you did it. Okay. I just wanted to say thank you to everybody um, for your work. Um, it's good to see the BPA start to move toward the, a lens that's helpful um, in really addressing fair housing and affirmatively furthering fair housing. I I um, I like the way that um, Councilor Bob is tying in language for the whole city and affirmatively furthering fair housing for the whole city um, and addressing issues of systemic segregation. Uh, thank you. Um, and I'm very excited for this. I'm excited to see the next working session when we, we do talk about implementation. Um, and this is, uh, no, there's no other place I, I want to be either. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. I have Councillor Mejia, then Councillor Bach. Yeah, so I was, I, um, no, I was raising my hand to let you know that I was back in the, in the Zoom um, and that I'm listening in. I do have a question or maybe a, some clarity around some of the commercial, small business yeah, amend, I, amendment conversation. Um, I'm just wondering what role has, uh, you know, Chief Barrows and his people have played in, in that development process. Um, I know there are a lot of folks right now, um, as a result of COVID, you know, they're paying like four or $5,000 for rent in certain spaces that they haven't been able to use. Um, is there a way that we can um, do a income adjusted type of of, of way for small businesses to be able to rent and or, or own space based on an, an in, uh, income adjusted type of environment kind of uh, metrics um, for small businesses. And I'm not sure if that's something that 
is feasible or is worth looking into considering not making any sense absolutely worth looking into i don't know that we can do it in this zoning amendment i firmly believe and know that a lot of the biggest issues is around rights that commercial tenants have versus residential tenants and they're just radically different under the law one of the things i know the city had worked on in small business uh with count um with uh chief uh, barrows was um making sure that commercial entities got on long-term leases through a study of many of the immigrant owned small businesses they found that many of them have month-to-month -month leases which is what is killing them now because that you know their lease ends at the end of the month and if they haven't paid they basically can be evicted so it was putting them on long-term leases and then i know a negotiation point for this zoning amendment is when new development comes in to make them um, actually uh, consider small businesses and their displacement and how their their business is going to help or not i think that's really important when we're talking about oh you want a commercial space in the bottom who would use it who lives there are you looking to local businesses to move in there first i mean no not not to knock whole foods or anything but not everyone finds that to be an accessible grocery store mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So that kind of analysis, I think this this zoning and correct me if I'm wrong, Sanal and Brian and John, I believe this kind of uh, would be happening now for PDAs and going forward and now analyzing what the commercial space is going to look like and also how it could impact local businesses. Yeah, because I would like to say that the whole food we used to be the platanero and um you know they transitioned it to whole foods and i think that as a as a as an amendment we need to look at the cultural makeup of a neighborhood and and seeing if we're going to change anything that makes sure that it doesn't impact the cultural fa fabric of neighborhoods i think it's something that i would like to see in that text amendment at least for commercial um as, as something that i would like advocate for and then the other the other piece is I'm always going back to accountability. I'm wondering whether or not this amendment um, and if there's any ways for us to kind of have checks and balances where there's, um, so how are we gonna, how are we gonna manage the, the execution of this? Will, will there be some system in place for accountability that there's there like a, a small civilian review board? Like how are we going to, how are we gonna, how are we going to hold this accountable, I guess? Because all of these things are really great, but then when you and I move on to other things in our lives, then who's going to be the ones making sure that these things are being upheld? I'm just curious about the process after the implementation. Um, but that's why it's so key that it's one put in the zoning law so that whoever goes to sit and analyze, they have to go back and reference that law and analyze it, period. Um, I see you, Councillor Janey. The other thing is um, the tool kits that we're going to be talking about extensively in the next working session and how people are assessed is going to come up. And then finally, making sure that the, prob the process is public and that that approval, that they're gonna approve it, they've demonstrated, and this is for the BPDA, they, they will demonstrate all that's been assessed, all the impacts and how they're gonna be mitigated before they approve a PDA or approve a project. But it must be public. Thank you. You're welcome, Councillor Mejia. Councillor Bach and Councillor Janey. Uh, thank you um, so much, Councillor Edwards. And, and I'll say, I'm supposed to get out of the habit for speaking for the Boston Housing Authority, um, but they do indeed have some programs. Um, I used to run one of them uh, that uh, is involved in helping folks who start to make more money um, stay in their units and save up money for buying a house um, or other kind of major life moves. And there's also some ways of excluding income, but it, it's, there are federal limitations that do create those cliff effects. It's a big issue. Um, and I think that uh, actually, as we think, the way I would connect it to this conversation um, is that as we think about uh, like fair housing mitigations that developers can take, thinking about places where we have a little bit of a cliff effect, even in our IDP units, um, and just just because of the way that uh, we set like a an income limit, and then um, and the way that if you because IDP units are not based on a thirty percent scale of your income, like if you sort of your life changes in one direction or the other, you lose a lot of money or you gain a lot of money. So suddenly that housing yeah, isn't an option for you anymore. 
Um, and that's, a, I think it is, a, it's, it's a limitation on that as opposed to the kind of federally backed vouchers and, and um, public housing units. And so thinking about what are the ways that developers could provide some more flexibility for people to move within a range of income um, while staying in that housing would be like a potential way of thinking about a, a, an option for fair housing mitigation. And I'll just say for people, this is in the, in the vein of coming attractions because to Councillor Edwards' point, we're not really doing this today. Um, but uh, I, I put into my memo a sort of long list of potential AFFH intervention options precisely. And I think it connects to the zoning because we have to have, we have to have a place in zoning that says, you know, there's gonna be a process by which you not just get analyzed, but sign up to do some things that will help address fair housing in the city of Austin. Um, and then you're held accountable for those. Um, and I think talking about what that menu of options looks like and who evaluates what's reasonable for a project is all a, a part and parcel of what we have to talk about to get to circle back on that conversation that Councillor Edwards and the BPDA and I were having before about um, about kind of what's the other shoe dropping with a PDA uh, and how do how do we hold that accountability? Um, but excited to excited to be having those conversations going forward. Um, and 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 the one other piece I know um, advocates have mentioned the sort of outside piece. I'm also interested in the inside piece in kind of like hiring capacity inside the BPDA. Um, I know that there was just this uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion director position listed. Um, I think that uh, you need you need somebody. Um, Tim used to be the housing policy manager at the BPDA. Um, I think you need somebody who's managing a fair housing uh, zoning aspect in the BPDA who's who has expertise in fair housing. So I think those are also complementary conversations that we should be having going forward um, that aren't about what's what's written in the zoning code. Thanks so much, Councilor Edwards. Thank you, Councilor Janey. Councilor Janey, you had raised your hand. Or I hope maybe it was just to get into the conversation or. Councilor Janey. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Now we can. Okay. okay, thank you so much. Um, just a quick follow-up, and I'm not sure if this is uh, the appropriate conversation to be asking this question, but I wanted to build on Councilor Mejia's questions around uh, business and how um, the economy plays into this, particularly economic justice issues. Uh, one of the things that I'm advocating for, and I know other colleagues are, is um, planning that allows small business owners to condoize their space. And so I don't know if that's something uh, that would be part of this planning. So we passed this uh, tax amendment. Would, nothing would prohibit us from doing um, just that, right? Doing more to support small businesses? Not at all. Not okay. at all. All right. Yeah. All righty. Thank you so much. That was um, my my main question there. I'm looking forward to continuing this. There's so much to to sort out and learn. Thank you again, uh, Councillor Edwards. And thank you to the administration uh, for your work and for putting forth um, some new language. I'm really anxious to kind of get into that language and see, you know, how all of this uh, makes sense and, and plays into something good uh, moving forward. So thank you again. So we're at a little over um, two hours. We did start a little late, so we're probably actually zeroing in on the two hours. Um, I know we had technical difficulties at first uh, with our language. Um, I will note that um, our interpreter has been uh, recording Spanish interpretation of this entire conversation. So that will be available. Um, for some reason, we couldn't get the app to work today so that folks could be watching our mouths moving and, and hearing Spanish come out. Um, but I, I, I wanna say thank you again um, to the administration. I wanna say thank you uh, to the task force and, and all the members and the amazing amount of work they put through. I wanna say thank you to my colleagues, Councilor Bach. Uh, thank you so much. Um, it's, it's, it's gonna take a lot of work and I'm just very happy for the commitment to do it. Um, again, confirming we're going to get this done as a city of Boston. We're going to make history and we're going to get this done. I'm hoping before September, which means um, 
I'm willing to schedule a second working session. Uh, in the meantime, following open meeting rules, I can talk to the administration directly. Kenzie can talk to the administration directly um, and making sure that we're getting to uh, compromise language that gets us towards the ultimate goal, right, of equity and planning. Um, so I would ask if my client, or, or clients, excuse me, I went back to being a legal services attorney. <clears throat> I would ask if my colleagues have any closing remarks. And then if after that, we'll go ahead and close out the working session. We'll go in order of arrival. So Councilor Bach. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to again say how excited I am about this and how much, you know, I think um, I think I think there's an opportunity here to get something to get something that's really good in the in the letter in the zoning and that also can kind of live and breathe in our city um, in a in a way that in a way that changes things. And when I think about um, when I think about like what could we do like those of us on the council, those of us working in the administration, folks who are sitting in advocate seats, like what could we do that um, would really like have changed the city of Boston 50 years from now when we're all doing other things and sitting in our rocking chairs, we hope. Um, you know, desegregating the city in a serious way, like making it possible for people to live where they wanna live um, and, and especially like, and not be discriminated on the basis of being in a protected class, um, whether that's race or income or family size or disability, like that to me, um, like we throw around the word structural change a lot, um, but that's like the communities we live in, um, the communities we have access to is really the substructure of our lives. So, uh, so to me, this is, this is like a super fundamental conversation and it's, uh, and it's worth doing with urgency and also worth doing right. So just want to thank you again, Madam Chair. You're muted, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I believe Councillor Braden had to go. So Councillor Wu may also no longer be with us. I'm gonna go through Councillor Flynn, Councillor Flaherty who had joined us, and Councillor Mejia. Closing remarks. I'm next. Yeah. Oh, so I just I just want to say uh, thank you, Councillor uh, Edwards um, and Bob and the administration and everyone who's participating and all of our community activists who have been on this ground fighting this fight for so long. And um, just this being my first term and to seeing this type of bold um, action being taken on behalf of, of issues that we have been screaming and hollering about for centuries um, is just super inspiring and exciting. And to see that um, there is a, a level of, 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 of agreement and um, excitement from across all different departments it really speaks volumes to your leadership, Lydia, to really core house and, and get everybody on board. Um, so really super excited to just be a part of the conversation and grateful to, to chime in however I can and here for all of it. Congratulations. Um, Councilor O'Malley may have um, had to leave, and then Councilor Daney wasn't sure if she was able to stay. She may also had to leave. I think there was a meeting. So thank you all. I'm here. I'm, I'm oh, sorry. I, I just want to echo what uh, Councilor Mejia said. I mentioned you and, and our colleagues in the administration, but really the advocates, the the residents at neighborhood associations. Um, particularly in my district, like, you know, I am really blessed that we have so much activism uh, in our district and particularly now, this is how we're going to get this work done. So thank you guys for being at the table. Shout out to Angela, heard you on the call earlier. Um, so thank you again, Madam Chair, looking forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you guys so much. Um, with that, uh, I want to say thank you again. I will be setting up a second working session and we'll be working in between those sessions to make sure that what we present is again, pushing the ball forward. Um, so everyone else, uh, see, I've called on all my colleagues. I wanna say thank you and have a good day. With that, this working session is over. Bye-bye. Bye all. -bye. Well.